Welcome to today's episode. On this podcast, we like to discuss the latest installments of a different series every show. We've just finished watching the first six episodes of Disney Plus's Goosebumps, a teen comedy horror based on the extremely popular 90s scholastic series written by R.L. Stein. Do you have any idea how many Goosebumps books there are? 50. 235 and counting. Wait, were 62, wait, he's still going? Yes, 62 in the original series that ran from 1992 to 1997, and that crossed over with, while, while he was also working on the television show, which I believe started in 1995, Goosebumps Series 2000, then Goosebumps Horrorland, Goosebumps Slappy World. They're all giant series. Now, currently he's doing Goosebumps House of Shivers, which I think is two books which have either been released or are getting released very soon. Many tuning into this show, the one we're about to review, the Disney Plus slash Hulu show, are probably familiar with the 1995 to 1998 series that ran on Fox Kids slash Cartoon Network. Um, I hate to use the word reboot because I, I, I even discussed this in the Frasier episode. Most reboots are unnecessary. They're repetitive. They're just plain bad. But um, this show is technically sort of a, an off-skew reboot. It's no longer an anthology series. Yeah, I was going to say. It's a serialized event. Um, it's all building toward one climactic finale, kind of like the movies were, which there were two of them. The second one did not do as well as I the first. I do not remember the second one even coming out. I saw the first one. It might but... as well have just been a direct-to-video movie, I think, from everything I've read. Um, I, I also just saw the first. But also, like the movie, the kids are no longer like um, middle schoolers or elementary schoolers. They are tween. They, they are sorry, teens, not tweens, and they are borderline adults at that because the cast is all in their mid to late twenties. Yeah, wasn't Dylan Minnette? I might be remembering that wrong, but wasn't he starring in them? Uh, he was starring in the first one. Again, I have not seen the second uh, movie, but I'm talking about the show now. The show's teens are all mid to late twenties. Uh, they look it. Harold is probably the oldest, or looks the oldest. Out out of all of them. I disagree. I think Isaiah looks the oldest. However, the actual oldest is James. I believe James really? is 27 years. Yes. I uh, would have guessed he was the youngest out of all of them. Well, he's 27 years old. He's played by a trans man. I believe Isaiah is 25 years old. They None of them have like huge acting careers up until now. Isaiah was in EastEnders though, right? I uh, yeah, that. he's British. And sometimes you can hear his British accent break through, specifically when he's saying other people's names. Like <laughs> the way he pronounced Margot several times was like, oh, but I had to know previously that he was British before I could even figure that out. And then Isabella, yeah. how old is Isabella? It's funny because I, I don't know her age. Her name, She's played by Anna Yi Puig, but um, the Isabella name is actually the name of her co-star who plays Margot, <laughs> Isabella Briones. Um, and, and so it must be strange hearing, because I've, I've seen it where actors play the same character name as themselves, yeah. but never where like they have to hear someone a, else's name. I just can't imagine <laughs> like being on set there's got to be several times during the cues where someone's referring to her and they're, they're not exactly sure. Um, but, but yeah, you've got these, what, five kids? Isaiah, Margot, James, Isabella, and Lucas. And they are the uh, focal points of the series. You also have their parents, which have some connection to this dark past. And then, of course, you have the evil villain, Harold Biddle, who has taking over the body of this Nathan, the new teacher played by... Justin Long. Justin Long. I thought the first episode was going to say that it was directed by Zach Kreger. And I'm not even joking. I, like The first episode reminded me so much of Barbarian because Justin Long is playing a morally better, but still almost the same character as that. Hmm. Yes. Do you think a lot of people who have seen Barbarian will be watching this show, though? Because Barbarian is a very dark movie compared to this. this I is, see this... This is for kids. I see this series, and I don't know. I actually disagree with you because, yeah, someone in like late elementary school or middle school would be fine watching this but I see this as a series of unfortunate events where it's like I feel like adults are going to probably like this series more than the kids watching it. Do you it. want to know what I've heard it related to most? It isn't series of unfortunate events. It's Riverdale. Riverdale? Yeah and the ones that I would relate it to are uh, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina mostly because in the first few episodes of that I believe a teacher is possessed and that's exactly what happens here. Um, I think that if you wanted to see a more adult version of this or at least like a cornier version that also takes it to a much darker level like a rated r yeah. level you just tune into todd in the book of pure evil because it's got <laughs> the same like week by week format where there's like a crazy haunted object but then you've got these teens who are acting out to the point where it's not appropriate at all versus these guys who are kind of either cliche or or just kind of doing the normal high school tropes that you'd expect i also compared it to harry potter because of what we find out about the villain and kind of how like Lily Potter mm -hmm. and Snape have that relationship. 
it turns out that the villain here, Harold, um, had a good relationship with one of the moms, uh, Sarah, yep. right? And who is the mom? Who is she the mom of again? Was that Isabella or is that Margot? Margo's That's Margot's, mom. yeah, mom. And then also, of course, um, uh, Jumanji. I kind of felt the vibe, <laughs> vibes there of that. And uh, and then I want to ask you about Chucky because you've watched that yes. series. Yes. So episode six specifically, obviously you have Slappy, who I think is probably the most popular villain of all of Goosebumps. Yeah. And yes, the scene, especially where Harold is in front of the uh, school and he's giving his talent show or whatever, that was like almost ripped straight from the Chucky pilot because something very similar happens there. I would compare this to school spirits, kind of obvious horror in the high school setting after party because every single episode follows one one character and it's almost a different genre of horror while with after party it was a different genre of comedy but honestly every single episode i have multiple uh things that they reminded me of like you have a uh, talk to me i think in the second episode when there's like a mask that it that uh sure, no, no, no. before we get into what every single episode did i do want to talk about what the overall series no, is yeah. doing because we start with this idea that there's a haunted house but how did that house get haunted well there was a guy who lived there right this yes. harold biddle in the 90s, kind of like that Jumanji thing where the guy gets stuck in the game. Well, he dies there because of a house fire, but we don't exactly know the ins and outs of that until episode six. We just know that he has a bunch of haunted objects in his basement where he dies. And then we jump to 2023 and there are a group of kids and all the items that you were talking about that were in that basement mm -hmm. end up with one of the kids. And we learn uh, like by episode six, kind of the backstory as a herald, uh, he is trying to haunt all of the parents that were responsible for his death. Uh, he's not only trying to haunt the parents, he's trying to go after their lineage as well. It so, reminded me of It in that way. Yes, exactly. It's just like it. It's just like a bunch of stories. But yeah, they had to serialize everything from the original show, which again, just did one-offs and yes. then make it so that like this basement housed every single haunted item for better or worse. Because I thought it was going by, to be an anthology series. By do <laughs> yeah, so did I originally. But by doing that, they kind of lessen the significance of any particular item because they can't concentrate fully on it. Uh, even, but, but we'll get into that in a second. So there's Isaiah, there's Margot, there's James, there's Isabella. Uh, Isaiah, how would you describe him? He's, he's a, a jock, he's a popular kid, he has a girlfriend. Again, his best friend is James. Star quarterback, his parents are really, really relying on him to, I guess, bankroll them yep. for the rest of their he, lives. He, he's kind of like the BMS MacGyver character because his arm is supposed to be great with, yeah. with football. To the few people who understand that <laughs> reference. Also, his dad is played by, his dad, Ben, is played by... Uh, uh, the dad in Heroes from the first season, the one that could go through walls and stuff, which I found interesting. Wow. I did not recognize him. That was him. him? Yeah, he has a beard now. Um, and then you got Margo, who's the nerdy neighbor of Isaiah. Isaiah, sorry, uh, his best friend, sort of a love interest. No, not sort of. She is the love interest. Well, she's sort of a love interest to him, but she's also sort of a love interest to Lucas now. Now there's that love triangle yes, there's going a love on. Triangle, but yeah. Isaiah, at the beginning of the series, is going out with Allison, right? Yes. And, and Allison, I feel like, just isn't given that fair a shot. It like, seemed like she was going to be a big part of the series and then, yeah, after the first episode, she doesn't really show up again. Uh, she shows up. She, but, she, but it's not like she's not one of the main group members. Yeah, she's not one of the five. However, I think that's leaving her with an opportunity to come back later because I just don't feel like they justified her. Like, he dumped her so quickly. He dumped her Very off fast. screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, but there's got to be a backstory behind that. Then there's James, the gay best friend, again, played by a trans man. So I'm assuming that he incorporated some of that mm -hmm. into the, into this play. He's a social show butterfly. He's crushing on a jock named Sam. And I guess we've reached that point in history where the show just automatically assumes everybody's okay with that. Yeah. So there's no... So, so that's nice because you no longer get that awkward scene of him having to, like, come out to the school. Uh, the Sam guy is already known yeah. at, as being gay as well. So um, they obviously, in the third episode, I think, hook up. At the very beginning right? of that episode, too. Okay. Yeah. And then Isabella, the outcast tech girl, she's the newest to the crew. She has a little brother. Her mom is sort of a bitch. Um, no, yeah, abusive no lie. and everything, yeah. That, see, that's weird, because I, I saw that on Wikipedia. They said that she was, like, abusive or, like... Like, I can understand being the villain. She hasn't, like, hit her or anything. She, she just is... She's an evil character. Like, she did put that one Nora into the psychiatric hospital and was, like, doping her up with drugs. 
But then there's Lucas, who his mom is Nora. But Lucas, I feel like, is the most interesting character because he is the one that does not fit the normal trope. Lucas is the one that you thought was the most interesting character. Yes, but again, because Isaiah, just like the jocks of every world, uh, Margot, the nerdy neighbor um, who doesn't realize how pretty she is, James, again, the gay best friend, Isabella, this outcast uh, tech girl. But Lucas, Lucas isn't like, he's not cocky and he's not insecure. Like that... Usually you fit into one group or the other. You're the introvert or the extrovert. He's this daredevil. He's stupid, but he's honest. And he's I just felt like he the was most the non character. He's though. the yeah. I, I maybe that's the closest you can get to a trope. But I felt like he was the most actually authentic character because of how much he just didn't give a <laughs> most crap. actual high school character. Uh yeah. Like especially when he broke the drone and then he went into the office and he wasn't really like giving two shits about it. Yeah. He was just offering to pay her uh, Isabella back um, five dollars all the time. Week, yeah. Yeah. But I thought his daredevil storyline and even the worm storyline. I saw people talking about how that one felt the most goosebump um and that's episode four right yes uh it's centric so i so i would have to say that his episode and and probably his character as a whole were, were the most interesting to watch for me i think it's important to note that by episode three because you originally told me what episode if i'm not gonna watch the whole series should i stop at? and i said episode three because by episode three is when the show feels more goosebumps you were saying people got that in episode four and i definitely did but by episode three you're getting kind of the groundhog day happy death day prestige coherence sure. so by episode one, can we both agree that episode one kind of sucks? <laughs> like I, uh, episode one, I, I felt, give it a seven out of ten. I don't know if I I'd go so far as to say that. I felt okay, like would they you were say that it was crumbs. the weakest of the six? Yes, I'll, I'll go that. That's part, yeah. what I would say too, because I just felt the introduction to it felt uh, like we'd seen this so many times. I felt like they laid it on a little thick. How Isaiah was so popular at this school. It is his episode, but he stumbles upon this camera and suddenly it's able to tell the future and it's always a bleak future. So he sees himself breaking his arm. And then at the end of the episode, lo and behold, he breaks his arm. <laughs> like, what's the yeah. big twist there? And also, it just didn't feel as... Uh, I get that it's R.L. Stein and, and he actually has made a rule that he's never going to kill a, a child in his books. Like, that's never going to be That's never happened? Of course not. Yeah. I mean, this is just supposed to encourage people to read and stuff. So there's never really that huge threat. You know that these characters are always going to survive in one way or another. But it felt like that was the most cliche episode. But as it went on, I felt the episodes got better and better and better. That's kind of what I was saying. Yeah. Because by episode three, you're getting, you're getting kind of time travel. Episode four, you're getting a monster movie practically episode five you're getting some like a harley quinn almost it reminded me a lot of uh episode five this season five three went by so quickly in my head i hardly even remember it but i but it kind of melded with episode six i i think that like when you're just getting from three to six those are the best episodes um, like yeah i feel yeah. like it really decided to hit its stride after those in episode two. two it's sad because i know the mask is probably people's favorite besides slappy as far as villains yeah even because the goosebumps, that's the way even the goosebumps uh, show started with the mask episode and it's that's considered one of the best ones yeah it, most people have probably if they've seen the original series seen that specific episode it has a very high IMDb rating. I think it kicked off uh, the series really well. And so when they did it here, I feel like episode two kind of fell into the episode one thing where, where it didn't really do justice to the haunted items because she puts that thing on. We see like two scenes, one where she's just like in a 10 second thing going through the party, feeling confident with herself. Yeah. Suddenly the mask is the thing that she loves. And then in, in the next scene, we see her just turning into a straight up troll and then she rips it off and realizes that when she sees her brother, that she can't be a troll anymore. And that was it. Like, all the deep thought and the background to the mask, like, it, it demanded two episodes in the previous uh, series. And, and it really delved into the thought of, like, how you see yourself as a person. And this thing, it was it was way less about that. And it just didn't feel like the mask got its due dil diligence. So, so with that, just jumping to episode six, what did you think of Slappy? Because I really liked what they did with Slappy's episode. Slappy, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of a wild jump because his whole thing was back in the, what, the 1920s? Um, and they did just F for him and we got a new character. And it, it just, the kids were hardly in it. Yes, that, I know. That so was, I don't know why you're a, asking me. What, how does that relate to the mask? Because the mask and Slappy, as we stated, are the two most popular, I feel like, uh, episodes Got or it. the two most popular villains. The difference is the mask was never supposed to lead the franchise. Like like I said, uh, R.L. Stein has made Slappy World, which is a whole series based on Slappy's mm -hmm. like tales. Slappy, even in the movies, 
was also the one like pulling all the strings. He was the one in yep. control. He's the evilest. He's able to like map out everything. He's the guy that has wormed his way into the dead spirit of Harold and made Harold still demented enough to think that he needs to find Slappy. Now, I do have a theory about Slappy, but I want to save that till the end. First, let's talk about episode three. So we've gone through, again, Isabel's episode with the mask. We've gone through Isaiah's episode with the camera. Then we get to, of course, um, James's episode. And I love how it started because, again, Groundhog Day is really, really fun. And he's stuck in the house, repeating the party. But within 10 minutes, he breaks out of it. Yes. I am surprised that a TV show that usually has this type of storyline has not done that where it just kind of almost gives you a MacGuffin a third of the way through the episode. Because you, especially with shows like Mystery Spot, they can be great, like Supernatural. But you kind of have to buckle in and be like, all right, let me see, like put my thinking cap on and see what he's going to be able to do with all these different versions. And then no, it just ends up being that all the times that he did the time travel, it just made a separate, or those are people are still around those versions of him, but they're all evil. The name of the episode was The Cuckoo Clock of Doom. I saw it as like cuckoo redo because he was <laughs> continually just repeating that party until he breaks free. Suddenly he's having to f- these these jelly monster guys like kidnap him. Imprison him. They're, they're basically gushers because as soon as you hit them on the head, they explode. Yes, and that's right. how episode two ends. Yeah. Isabella actually misses a cue shot on a pool table and then, yeah, it hits James and he just explodes into goo. Yes, and that's what originally hints at the fact that he's not the real James. James is stuck in, uh, what is he, uh, in a hole? Yes. In a, in a mine hole for like a week, like he says. And so there's all these impersonators of him running around. They're posing as him. Once, They're being complete dicks as friends. Yeah. And he's also like riling stuff up. He talks to Allison about how uh, Isaiah really likes Margot, which is true, but at the same time didn't need to be said there. And he kind of manufactures that. The, the funny thing is that when um, uh, at the beginning of the episode, James is like freaking out because he's not able to get with Sam. Like he keeps on blowing it when yes. he's when he's trying to hang out with him and, and, and make out with him. But like Isaiah tells him, you gotta be yourself. You're not being <laughs> yourself, right? Yeah. And then later on in a future episode, when uh Isaiah dumps Allison, James turns to Isaiah, who's about to ask Margot out, and he's like, Wait, you don't think anything's going on between Margot and Lucas? That's what Isaiah mm-hmm. says to James. And James is like You know, you're never yourself. If you were more yourself, you know what Lucas is? He's himself. And so it was like the same message. And I felt that that was lazy writing. Because it was like, why are they both saying the same thing to each other? I think they're trying to make a connection. I mean, they're best friends with one another. Yes, but if they're both struggling with the same exact problem, it doesn't feel as if like one has it solved. Usually the person who's giving the advice, you would think from the first episode that Isaiah knew what he was talking about. But really, it just seems like James wanted to get revenge for that. Anyways, in this third episode, they end up defeating the gusher people. People, and then they find out what at the end. Well, I forgot how that one like uh, twists. There's always a twist at the end. I remember all of them except for the third one. Okay, well, episode three ends and they've come to the conclusion that... They, oh, you know what the twist was? It was that uh, one of the goo monsters survived and then went back to the mansion, or That's sorry, the was. haunted haunted place that uh, Harold is still hanging out in, Nathan, the teacher, Nathan Brad, Justin yeah. Long, yeah. And he finds the box. He has found the box that has Slappy in it gives it to um, Harold. Harold opens it, sees that Slappy isn't in there. He kills the last gusher. And then he like looks at the camera all angry. Like they ended this, they ended episode three and episode four, kind of the same, both with Nathan Brad or Harold, just kind of being evil and realizing that like basically trying to find Slappy or realizing the kids have something to do with it. I did. I did like Justin Long's portrayal. Like he knows horror. Obviously he was in what Husk or Tusk or whatever that movie was. Yeah. Barbarian. Like you said, Jeepers Creepers, where he, started off um he, he, the apple like the horror and that no i'm just kidding <laughs> um and then and then this but like he did a good job i thought with the idle hands thing because at first he's represented as like kind of a cool guy um the one thing i don't understand is how he is still acting as a teacher because they even said he's missing a lot of classes but yeah. he keeps on showing up at the school we just never see him actually giving the chance to speak to any of the, his students which doesn't seem very believable. And then, of course, we haven't talked about any of the parents, but once we get to Rob Hubel and how he plays a guidance counselor, I think he might be my favorite character. Episode four talks about it. That's Lucas's episode. 
uh, the most uh, organic to the Goosebumps way because it's all about him eating worms and then becoming a worm man. He becomes invincible. Yes. He's able to, like, he, for most people, they would have to go to the uh, to the hospital if they break his arm. And instead, the worms are just helping him put his arm back in place. And that's what makes him think that he can do what his dad did when his dad died, do this, like, crazy intense... The boom intense... of doom, I think they call it. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, where it's, he's it's just taking jump. a motorbike and then, he yeah, he's jumping and then going down this crazy path. Evil Knievel style. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, and and then he gets stopped from doing it, and then he barfs up all the worms because he talks to his mom. He talks to uh, Margot, who yes. he has a thing for, and uh, he spits out all the worms. Then the worms become a hulking giant monster. Well, you should say why he spits out the worms. Well, he gets I, very upset because he learns that apparently his dad, who, who died, who always thought that it was an accident when he was doing this jump, he learns from his mom, which is actually kind of dark, that uh, Nora says to Lucas that his dad committed suicide practically yes he, he, he didn't want to survive the dad had was like very depressed for sure that was what affected him the most however i thought you were talking about the fact that margo's dad and uh what, what is it uh lucas's mom are having an affair with yeah. one another technically um margo's mom and uh and her dad had a separation going so it's not exactly like a completely was unfaithful. that revealed was that revealed in episode five because it seemed like for the first four episodes it was just an Margo ongoing said thing. that she suspected it in an mm -hmm. earlier episode but she didn't know for sure later on it was told straight to us uh, in the camera because we get a scene between uh, Sarah and what is the dad's name the guidance guidance counselor's name uh, they they Colin. Yeah, Colin. Um, they, they straight up tell each other, it's like, I thought we were in a separation mode and blah, 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 blah. We should probably talk about the parents at this point because that's what episode five is all about. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, 1993, so uh, Harold, we've just been assuming, is this evil spirit dude who was also a kind of a, a crazy kid who, um, who was stalking maybe Sarah. But really, we learn that he just moves in with his parents because he was bullied at a previous school. He joins this school. He has that old camera that we see from the first episode. Yep. He joins the photography club, actually makes a lot of friends, actually gets pretty close to Sarah to a point where they could be possibly a thing. However, then he finds Slappy, becomes extra popular with Slappy. Slappy's able to invade his mind, kind of like a mind worm, convince him that everybody's evil and that they're all making fun of him. He goes a little crazy, but then the friend group, who uh, is, is pretty new, including Nora, um, again, that's later on going to be uh, Lucas's mom, uh, she sees Slappy talking to uh, Harold and then tells the rest of the group they go back to the house to break out or take Slappy away yep. because they realize what's what's going on. They can't burn him. In fact, it was one of the uh, parents she just knows that, who knows though. that. Yeah. But she has no reason to know that. That was just one of those things where it's like, oh, sh she's able to tell the future or something like that. The parents weren't able to burn him because the parents were also trying to stop Slappy from messing with their kid. Um, they didn't know that he was evil, perhaps, but he, they knew that he was a doll and that <laughs> their teenage son was kind and, of obsessed with and it. And Harold makes sure to correct them right away. That was probably my favorite scene, even though it was only one sentence where he's like, it's a dummy. Yeah. It's not a doll. Yeah. And then he turns his parents into dummies uh, with this spell that Slappy has taught him. But the reason why Harold ended up dying was that these kids were trying to take Slappy away. And then instead of taunting him, which we were led to believe was the reason why he dropped the candle in the basement and everything exploded, what really happened was they were trying to help him get out of there or warn him to get out of there. Yeah. And that's what led to the fire. And so really the parents aren't murderers, but in Harold's mind and also in Slappy's like uh, manipulated way, he believes that. And so that by episode six is all revealed. Yeah, it kind of gives you, it's episode six gives you all the answers because the, first five, yeah. the first five episodes, you're seeing different uh, different scenes kind of play out. In fact, some of the scenes come back to play in episode six and you kind of get the different perspective look that they do. But you, you don't really understand the full aspect of everything going on. And that's why I really enjoyed episode six and also episode five because of how much breadcrumbs they were giving you. One thing I'm realizing now is that every single 
single one of the items that the kids gets, including Slappy, is that they always take over the character's mind, either mentally or just, uh, or like, I don't know, physically. Because you get yeah, Isaiah. That's the only two ways you Isaiah, can take over no, someone. No, for example, Isaiah with the Polaroid, it yeah. doesn't actually do anything to him, but like psycholi- psychologically, psychologically, yeah, he's looking at the camera and he's like, oh no, I'm going to do terrible at this football game. And then that's what ends up happening. The mask literally does it where she just puts it on and it takes over her mind. Mm -hmm. James, it's it's different characters, but it's still him and they're just being dicks to everyone that they know. Lucas, it's the worms. In the fifth episode, it's the book that uh, Nathan Brad gives to Margo for kind of that exact reason to see what happened to them, to see what, ha what their parents did to Harold. Yes. So it's always some type of thing that is taking over the character's mind. Uh-huh. Uh, and it, that's why Nora's in a psych psychiatric mm -hmm. hospital. Is because when she explains to the cop what happened to her son, Lucas, with all the worms, obviously no one's going to believe her. And obviously the only people who would believe her are... The parents are all sort of dicks, except for Sarah and Nora. The rest of them <laughs> yeah. have kind of committed to the lie that they will never talk about Harold or magic or any of that again, especially with their kids. Um, Nora, Ben, Sarah, Colin, Eliza, and Victoria. Eliza and Victoria, I believe, are the worst of the, the bunch. James's mom and Isabella's doctor of a mom. Usually the doctors are presented in a, in a nicer way than they are here. Um, the, the show, you reminded me when you said Stranger Things, right? Yes. I would compare Harold's character sort of to Jonathan Byers' season one, where he's obsessed hmm. with his camera, and he's a little bit stocky towards... Uh, w w what's her face? Uh, his uh, Sarah, right? No, no, no. In Jonathan Byers. Oh, uh, what's Nancy. Her face? Nancy, yes, of course. Um, yeah, but overall, what did you think of the series? What would you give it? I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. I didn't think that there was a bad episode. I know you and I probably differ on that. I would give the series an 8 out of 10. I will continue watching because it's 10 episodes, An right? 8 out of 10 is very high. Um, I do think that something needs to be said that, like, those... You didn't watch the original series. I watched some of it when they would replay on Cartoon Network around this time around Halloween. Really? So. Were you that age, though? Were you in the, like, impressionable youth time? I mean, it, it definitely wasn't a big influence on me, but I remember some episodes. If you're a 90s kid, or if that's what you're coming into, I can understand why you'd be a little disappointed, but I also think people are being a little critical, because as a 6.6 .6 on IMDb, a lot of places are called it generic. Um, however, it did get, like, a huge opening, like, when it was released on Hulu and Disney. I think they got 4 million viewers, and so that was cross-platform really high for them. Um, and uh, I do have a few questions before I get to my final thoughts. Um, one other comparison that I didn't make, but I, I should have made it earlier, was Harlan Coben's shelter. Because, uh, like we yes. talked about in that, um, you've got the haunted mansion, you got the kids, you got the uh, dead possessed, uh, introverted people, and then you also have their parents being a huge factor into it. Uh, Yellow Jackets because of the time difference, uh, it like you said, and then Lock and Key because again huh. the parents being such a big part of what's going on in the kids' lives and how some of them are dead and so they're unable to explain exactly how to get through this stuff. So there are a lot of retreads. It's funny Rob Letterman, the guy who directed and uh, created the show. He was also the director of, I believe, the movie, the first um, one that came out in 2015. That makes so much more sense. I was going to say that Rob Hubel is in this show, and if you remember, Ken Marino was in the movie, and I was like, oh, what's the connection? Do we have some type of multiverse thing going on right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Nicholas Stoller, who you should recognize that name because he also created Platonic. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, and so he's also one of the creators on the show. So let's talk about Rob Hubel because he is, plays Colin, and everybody else was in the past except for Colin. But Colin does seem to be integral in the plot line of everybody's storyline. Yeah. And guess who's missing? The only character that's missing in the future line is what? Slappy. Slappy. What if the guidance counselor is Slappy? What? What if Rob Hubel, he sort of looks like him, and he's such a milk toast character. He's supposed to be as tepid and like just goes with the punches as much as possible. He seems like there's there's no backstory for him. Everybody else got a backstory. He just, he exists, but what if he breaks out and the complete opposite of what Rob Hubel would be in this, Colin would be in this character, would be Slappy. I will say Rob, they take the Rob Hubel out of Rob Hubel's role. But I don't see, I mean, I, it could end up happening, but I don't see how, like, Colin really is. He is, looks like, like him. That's that's your main thing? I sort of. He looks like him. I mean, Colin, <laughs> Colin's, in a weird way, reminds me of Slappy's character, and it just feels like 
why else would everybody be protecting? I, I, I think have... I think your biggest piece of evidence is what you said with him not being in the past. And, yeah, and so he's, he's being notably the not there. He's notably not in the past. And it's also would bring a lot of credence to that scene where he goes over, Colin goes over to talk to Nathan about never teaching and how he has to, uh, like, when he goes over to his yes. house. Yeah, it would. Because then it would be like, oh, man, they were actually talking to each other at that time or something. Um, yeah, so so that's just my theory. The other thing I had to point out was that all the titles of the episodes, Say Cheese and Die, The Haunted Mask, The, the Cuckoo Clock of Doom, Go Eat Worms, a Reader Beware, Night of the Living, Living Dummy, most of those uh, were previous titles in the other mm-hmm. series. A Reader Beware, I believe, was the one of the lines in the original intro. Yeah. Well, not only that, they pay reference. Like in episode six, uh, the parents of Harold are talking to Harold and, and they're saying how he should maybe get an animal and they say golden retriever. And anyone who remembers the original Goosebumps intro remembers the golden retriever. Yeah, his eyes turn yellow. <laughs> yeah, really bad CGI back then. <laughs> People seem to remember the old series with fondness. I do think that the major weakness with this series, besides that it relies on some tropes, is that it zooms through those storylines that I think people are tuning in for. They want to see how these items really mess with someone's life and instead they're getting this like overall trajectory arc of just when when does the main character or the evil character get slapped. My, my, that said, I do enjoy the show too. I will give it a 6 out of 10 though, not my, an 8 out of 10. My cons with the show kind of are uh, A, the characters like we said, check boxes, but also they spend so much time on the Colin Nora storyline. Like they have <laughs> on the affair. There are so many scenes where it's like people have to figure out about it or they're just talking about it because both of them were one's married and one's a widow. And, mm-hmm. and it just seemed like it took over the plot so much. It, I may have even given it a nine out of ten had it not been for just them continually bringing it up throughout the series. A nine out of ten? I, for... I really enjoyed the show. I don't really see what the problem is with it. I... Once it gets to the third episode, that is when I was like, oh, this is really good. Also has a good soundtrack. You get SZA, you Billie Eilish, The Proclaimers, Radiohead, Nine Inch Nails, and more. Well, that's Disney for you. I would say it's also, you have to put your suspension on disbelief yes, for the absolutely. fact that the kids are so freaking old. I will say, like, I will just say that walking, too. Just walking around that high school and then constantly talking to each other like they're teenagers, but it just doesn't match with what their physical appearance there's, is. Yeah. That, there's that, and also the show seems kind of a little full of itself. It jam-packs itself with information, and it's like, if you're not on board with one thing, one thing that's crazy... I don't know if it, you I don't call know. it information, but you're saying that it jumps from one thing to the next. Yes, that's kind of what, yeah. Like, like the it, worm thing, if he barfs those up and then suddenly those worms go into the earth and burrow and create into yes, a giant that's monster. that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Where it's like if you, if you if you do not buy into like just the the fact that the worms are like controlling him, or you're that not they going could to die. like the episode. Uh, yeah, but the worms would then die from what is it? A, a shredding a machine, sawmill or something? Yeah, yeah it, where it just a shredding <laughs> machine. <laughs> well, that's like metal. But those worms are so tiny. A bunch of them would probably have gotten through and survived, and then they could just rebuild themselves yeah. like we'd already seen them do. But but th- we just gotta forgive it for that type of stuff. R.L. Stein uh, has also made other series so i was surprised to see that he he did the fear street um books that were based off of the netflix i remember movies the movies they, they tried to make grim eh, I, grim they tried to make they a, did they, they made did, a rated kids r did die in those, yes. in those things um but but not in this so yeah anything else you want to talk about no it's kind of all right what do you think of uh ephraim the the guy from the sixth episode who they, they used to kind of well that's harold's grandfather right yes i mean i didn't really think much of him okay was he Harold's grandfather or was he Nathan's grandfather? Because Nathan did inherit the house, so he technically did own it somehow. I don't know. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Hope you enjoyed this one. Bye. Bye.